happy to learn. Looking forward to that uh, very much so. So uh, without any further ado, let me introduce Monica Schmidt to you. Welcome, Monica. Uh, Monica is uh, head of the department of language and linguistics at the University of Essex. Uh, she is a world leading expert on language attrition and her research um, has been focusing on various aspects of the deterioration or loss of the native language capacity. Uh, she has numerous publications on the topic and monographs, uh, conference presentations, the different volumes, special issues. Um, she will present us uh, with her talk entitled, Slipping Through My Fingers, Under What Circumstances Do Multilingual Migrants Lose or Maintain Their Native Language? The stage is yours, Monica. Thank you so much, Andre. Thank you. Um, I would first like to really thank the organizers of this conference. I think it's been absolutely brilliant. I think Beatrice and Michael have been doing absolutely fantastic work in making sure that everything goes smoothly. And I'm really, really impressed. This is for me also one of the first big conferences that we're doing in this way. And I think it's, it's gone absolutely swimmingly. So thank you all very much. Thanks to everybody for coming this morning, afternoon, evening, or whatever it is, wherever you are. So um, I'm really, really pleased to be here. And I, I was very honored and very flattered to be asked. Um, the, oops, now the, this is the thing about Zoom. Sometimes the controls get lost behind other controls. Um, one of the things that we've really learned over the past months, of course, is how to get the most out of these uh, new methods that we have, Zoom and everything. And I'm going to be using throughout this talk, uh, I'm going to be using polls just to see, because I find it so hard when I give talks and when I teach online that I can't interact with the audience. It's very hard for me to gauge where you're at and whether everybody has understood everything or to check um, uh, certain things. So I'm going to be using polls. I'm just going to just uh, to start partly because I really need to know this, but also partly to try this out with everybody. Um, I would like to know how many of the people here today heard Barbara's talk yesterday, were at Barbara's talk yesterday morning, because of course my talk will build in a large, to a large extent on things that she said and also things that Antonella said, and there is going to be a poll a little bit later on. So this seems to be going very well. There are probably a few people in the audience who can't see the poll right now or can't vote. That sometimes seems to depend on what uh, what um, browser or what, what system you are using. Uh, if you can't see them, feel free to type it into the chat. But um, on the whole, it seems to me not everybody has voted yet. So anybody who hasn't done so, could you just sort of make your choice? Did you see it or didn't you see it yesterday? 51 out of six. Oh, right, great. It's going up now. So that, yeah, there seem to be a few people who can't, um, who can't, um, vote, but uh, about two thirds of you were at the talk yesterday. So I'm just going to not assume that you all remember everything that Barbara said yesterday. Um, one of the things, one of the people that she was talking about and really the godfather of attrition studies um, is Einar Hogan, um, which I've, I've probably butchered that name. So apologies for any Norwegians in the to any Norwegians in the office, uh, in the office, in the audience. Um, Einar Haugen was the person who very early on in the 1930s, in fact, noticed that the native language of immigrants, of people who live immersed in a second language environment, is prone to changes and that this not only takes place across generations, of course, that was something that linguistics had known for many centuries, but that there may also be changes and shifts within the attrition, within the lifespan of an individual. And that is what, that is the phenomenon that we call attrition. Um, he wrote a very, very interesting essay that I can only recommend everybody read, where he goes into this phenomenon of immigrants kind of straddling two cultures 
and also two languages and to some extent being homeless in both of these mainly to as he put it linguistic difficulties i think all of us who um, manage more than one language on a daily basis can kind of feel the connection to this sort of phenomenon and to this these kinds of ideas um, he uh, pointed out and i think that was something that was really an important um, an important observation, and it was very, very true, that both linguists and lay people see these kind of immigrants, immigrant varieties, this sort of blending of codes and mixing up of languages, um, that they see this as something that is beneath their dignity, that it's un unpleasant, it's debased, it's vulgar, it should be laughed at, because it is um, a wrong way of using language, so it's not something that we can study, it is something that should be discouraged and it is something that should be um, made fun of. This is an attitude that I think persists to this day. There are many examples. I'm just going to show you a, a couple of them. The first one is um, uh, an Olympic boxer, Regilio Tuur, who is a Dutch native speaker. When he had his big successes in his boxing career, he moved to New York in 1988. He, he was 21 at the time. And then he, um, like so many B and C list celebrities do, he participated in one of these um, television shows where celebrities learn to do something. In this case, it was uh, learning to jump uh, into, into a swimming pool from a high board, doing all sorts of somersaults and stuff. Um, slight complication for him there was the fact that he couldn't actually sw swim very well at the time. The um, point of this example is that he, he showed on these live, um, or, or partly live, partly pre-recorded shows that were aired on Dutch television, there was a really interesting pattern to his language use. He tr seemed to quite consistently start his sentences in Dutch and then after a few words slip into English. And I'm going to show you a few examples of how that worked. I put, uh, uh, I put uh, an English transcript uh, across it, but I'd just like you to sort of listen to the pattern of switching here. Eight years later, the young was 11, I think. I saw a boy drown, and after that, I never went back in the deep water. So I was always just calm and relaxed, and you know, and the more the more you tense, the more you want to do it fast, you know, the more the more it goes wrong. So that's my biggest challenge. My daughter is 15. She's very smart, and I I, I race a certain way, and I, I I want her to face life, you know, without having fear for it. Can I just check with you um, whether you think uh, how you how you how you respond to this is this something because on the on the uh, on on Dutch social media there was a huge big upheaval here people were really you know how people are on social media they were really trolling Regilio and were saying he's just he's just putting it on he's just showing off he's pretending to have forgotten his Dutch so that he can show how, how well he speaks English. What do you think? Do you think these switches are deliberate? Oh, this is a nice, this is a nice pattern here. <laughs> there are now, um, it started out absolutely exclusively, everybody was saying now, no, and now we have a few people who say this is probably, it's probably something that is put on, but 90% of you approximately think that this is, is something, it's real, it's just something that he isn't controlling that is just happening in his language. How about this thing here? Um, this is Stephanie Graf, who used to be the um, most successful female tennis player in the world until um, Serena Williams overtook her a few years ago. She was born and raised in Germany. She's about the same age as Barbara Köpke and myself. Um, she moved away from Germany in 2000 when she was 33 years old. When she married, she moved to the US. She had married Andre Agassi, who's a native speaker of English. And I'll show you a little example from a, a little snippet here from a media uh, award ceremony where she had a little speech. Um, 
can I just check uh, how many people in the audience here are able to understand German a little bit? Um, nicely distributed pattern, about a third of you know it well, about a third of you know it a little and about a third of you don't. Um, so I can, I would just like to encourage you to listen to the flow of the language because the reason that I'm showing you this is how people develop insecurities about using their language. And um, so even if you don't understand German, just listen to the delivery and you'll see the situation here is her husband had just said something in English and then the camera went on to her and you kind of see the sort of panic in her face. It's like, oh my God, I have to say something now. Oh my God, I have to do it in German. And um, so, This is what happened next. Ich werde mich dem Deutsch versuchen. Das ist leider nicht ganz so flüssig mehr, wie es war, aber um, ich werde es mich versuchen. Ich werde es versuchen. So what's happening here is she's, she's sort of fumbling around. She speaks with an accent, with an English accent. Um, she has this construction. She's trying the, the, to say, I am going to try to speak German. And this construction goes really badly wrong. She goes back two, three times trying to fix it and just can't figure it out. There's no way that this sentence, I mean, we all know this feeling, right? We find ourselves in the middle of a sentence and we just realize there's absolutely no way that the sentence is ever going to come to a good end. So that's the second example. What about this one here? Um, do you do you think, is she doing this? Is this something that she's doing deliberately, again, to show off that she's now an English speaker and that she's lost German? Or is this something that has just happened to her? That she can't, that she couldn't help. Okay, in this case, um, we seventy percent of you have voted, and we have absolute unanimity. Unanimity. Everybody who's voted says this is something that isn't deliberate. And I totally agree. I mean, there seems to be this view out there. If you have language attrition, if your second language rides in, you do this because you want to make yourself interesting. It's a sort of, oh, I'm so cosmopolitan. I've forgotten my native language and I have to resort to my second language. And I'm so cool. But if you see how Stephanie Graf came across. And this is, the, this is the reality for all of us who are arthritis. It happens to us all the time. We are not feeling cool and cosmopolitan at the moment. We're feeling like absolute dorks because we cannot um, use our language in the way in which we were used to and in the way in which we want to use it. Last example, I think this is a really interesting one. Um, this is the actor uh, Johannes Heesters. He was born in the Netherlands. He moved to Germany when he was about 30. So he uh, died in 2011. He was extremely old um, and he had his entire career in Germany. And then I came across an interview. He clearly thinks he's speaking Dutch here. Um, And he gave this interview when he was already over a hundred years old. The interesting thing about this is, um, if you don't know either Dutch or German, it will seem to you as though he's speaking perfectly fluently and competently. If you only know either Dutch or German, you will be very confused because you won't be able to understand what he's saying, or you'll only be able to understand parts of it. And you can only really follow it and understand it when you know both languages. So I'm go just going to show you a little snippet of this here. Don't worry about, just listen to the delivery and I'll sort of unpack it for you in, in a little bit. Don't worry if you can't understand. But he's just, it's basically just a sort of little introduction. He's saying, hello, welcome. I'm so pleased to be here. I'm so pleased that you've all come. Um, I'm pleased to be performing in the Netherlands again and I'll do my, and I hope you'll enjoy my show is basically what he's saying. Dames en heren, <laughs> ik ben froh bij euch te zijn. Ik ben froh dat ik hier in Holland, in Amersfoort, in mijn geboorteplaats optreden kan. En ik ben u dankbaar dat u gekomen bent, want ik doe alles wat ik kan om u te bevredigen met mijn... Oké, okay, so this is, here I've, I've transcribed this little bit for you. Down there is the English translation. Now, um... Here are all the words in this little snippet that are clearly Dutch. 
here are all the words in the little snippet that are clearly German. And then here are the words that are not unambiguously either language. So we see here that um, when you have two languages that are similar to each other, so Dutch and German, they share most of the grammatical framework. So it is possible to, to form sentences because you don't have to mess around with word order differences and things like that. It is possible to have these sentences. It is possible to have this very, very dense code switching. And I think it's quite interesting to see that very often the switches are at the sites where there are ambiguous words. So to be in German is sein and Dutch is sein. So they are very, very similar to each other. And that seems to be sometimes a bit that make him slip from one language to the other. Um, what is your impression here of uh, this? Uh, do you think he's even aware that he's doing that? Or do you think, uh, do you think that he thinks he's speaking Dutch? Uh, yeah. So there's one person who thinks that he probably is aware, two people think so, and all the rest of you so far don't think that this is something that is in any way controlled or deliberate. It, it, it seems to me, a um, couple more people want to vote? No. Um, so the overwhelming majority, 95%, uh, think that this is not deliberate. And it, it really seems to me that this would be something, I, I, I don't see how you could control this kind of thing, how you could just sort of switch back and forth all the time. I think that Hastis is thinking here that he's speaking Dutch. I think uh, a big a big component in what he's doing is actually the fact um, that he's quite old at the time. I think that there are age-related erosions of the, this efficiency in controlling and um, inhibiting bits of the language that you don't want at the time. I haven't been able, unfortunately, to find any excerpts of him speaking Dutch earlier than this. So I don't know how he was handling his languages when he was younger. But actually, these are just, these are just a few examples of what attrition actually looks like when it's happening in the wild. Um, and I want to look today at the extent to which a mature first language, so like uh, Barbara and Antonella yesterday, I'm only talking about late bilinguals, to what extent the native language can remain malleable and vulnerable or, or changeable throughout the lifespan, what the extent of the changes is that we can expect to find and also where their limit is, and what makes one person a good maintainer and another a good attriter. So before I um, launch myself into that, uh, about a third of you and indicated earlier on that you've been to Barbara's talk yesterday. How many heard the talk by Antonella? Seems to be more or less the same sort of thing. Also about two thirds were there and uh, slightly less than that. Here is the, here's the result. Okay. Um, so what Antonella pointed out yesterday was that there are very clear limits to how far languages can change in attrition. Um, the, uh, um, what we have seen is that attrition can affect every level of the linguistic repertoire from articulatory phonetics to grammar. Um, that the changes that we do find tend to be quite subtle um, and that there are clear limits to them. I'm going to show you just to illustrate this, um, an example of a study of the attrition of Dutch and German that um, I, uh, that I did together with Merel Kaiser. I did an investigation here of three fairly large groups of German speakers. A third of them had moved to Canada, a third of them had moved to the Netherlands, a third of them had stayed at home. And Merel collected data from Dutch speakers also in Canada and monolingual Dutch speakers. All of them were late bilinguals, all of them had at least 10 years residence. It was um, on average considerably more. I think the average length of residence was about 35 years, um, but the minimum was 10. 
We looked at, we did, some of you may be smiling right now, may be familiar with this. We gave them 10 minutes of a silent Charlie Chaplin film to watch. Um, but, and then immediately afterwards, we asked them to tell us what they had seen, what had happened in this film. That typically elicits about 750 to 800 words per person. That's about five to eight minutes um, of spoken language. So in total, we had 166,000 words and 27,000 utterances from this population of about 250 people. Um, let's look at pronunciation first. We know that attrition can affect phonetics. We know that individual phonemes in one in the first language can adapt under certain, certain circumstances to how they are typically pronounced in the second language. What we found particularly from the speakers that we looked at here was that um, the, their L in German had darkened in German L uh, at the end of the word is pronounced L. So in the German word you have two homophones, German many and English to feel. Many in German is feel. So you pronounce that feel versus feel. And that um, impact of pronouncing the L at the, in the coda position of syllables had um, really affected the way in which these German speakers pronounce that. Um, we also find uh, cross-linguistic adaptation of voice onset time that particularly affects German and Dutch and German and English uh, uh, and Dutch and English because voice onset time is more or less similar in English and German. But the, in Dutch, it is, um, Dutch has, um, has a much um, longer, no, shorter voice onset time, sorry. Um, so the English word coffee in Dutch is pronounced coffee. So there, there is less time between the release of the plosive and the onset of the vibration of the vocal folds. And this is a phenomenon that has often been shown to be very, very changeable in language contact. So that was found too in these populations. Um, we found that the way in which they pronounce their vowels had changed. Other people looking at similar populations have also found changes in roticity and changes in intonation. Cumulatively, these of course lead to a kind of foreign accent where we have the situation that very often arthritis are not perceived to be native speakers. So if you make native speakers listen to them and say, do you think this person is a native speaker of German or Dutch? They will um, say no. So what we have, what you see here is the, oops, where did the, where did the, the, uh, writing across the screen come from these these yellow lines. I don't know where that came from. That was not, okay, got rid of it. Sorry about that. Um, so what you see here is down here, a one is somebody who's perceived absolutely unambiguously native-like. And you can see that both the German speakers and the Dutch speakers, these are the monolingual controls, are perceived to be very native-like. However, there's a lot more variability. This here are the Germans in Canada. These here are the Germans in the Netherlands and also the Dutch speakers in Canada. So this clear nativeness is lost for many of them. In the area of morphology, um, germ case and gender are often uh, um, features that are considered to be good potential candidates, so things that could erose, uh, erode very easily. And sometimes people have predicted that there may be things, if you have a language that has a lot of different um, grammatical cases, maybe the system is reduced, maybe some of the cases are conflated, so that maybe German speakers would lose the distinction between the dative and the accusative and just have one oblique case. Maybe um, instrumental and prepositional cases would be lost. German and Dutch don't have that, Russian does, Finnish does. Um, and maybe there will be the emergence of a kind of default gender, either masculine in German or common gender in Dutch. However, what we find is that um, you can see here that German native speakers, the controls make very, very few errors. You have the median bar here at zero, and then there are a few people who make a few errors. Dutch native speakers 
make a little bit more errors. Germans in Canada are exactly the same as Germans in Germany for both of these features. Germans in the Netherlands, interestingly, have a few more features. So again, we see here the impact of similarity across languages and Dutch speakers in Canada also have more errors on these features than the um, native speakers. But you can see that really the highest levels of attrition that we find here are five, five errors per roughly a thousand words. I would challenge even the best second language speakers to equal that. That is really a very, very good performance after, remember, the average 35 years immersed. Um, so what we concluded from that is that case and gender are extremely stable features. Um, there are more errors here in mono, the, than the monolinguals do, but fewer errors than even the best second language learners. We never found consistent overgeneralizations. And we also found that these speakers are still as able to detect violations. So if you give them sentences containing errors on these features, measure their EEG, you will find exactly the same pattern of response than you do in monolinguals. And if you ask them to rate the sentences, they're also at ceiling. So they are dealing very, very well with these features. In terms of word order, um, we looked at the sentence patterns. Now, um, Dutch and German belong to this weird and sort of almost schizophrenic class of Germanic languages that are verb, um, verb second. So what that means is that in every main clause, you take any main clause, you take the finite verb and you nail it into the second position of the sentence. So you can have straightforward subject verb object sentences or subject verb whatever sentences like you do in England. Ich gehe heute nach England. I'm going to England today. Verb is in the second position. Subject is at the beginning, no problem. However, if I want to take the, uh, the time expression here and put it at the beginning of the sentence, um, in English, you would say, today I go. So you have two elements in front of the verb. In German and Dutch, that's not possible because we put something else at the beginning of the sentence. The subject has to move behind the verb. Um, and what we, can, what we put at the beginning can be anything. It could be prepositional phrases, temporal phrases. It could be the uh, object of the sentence or anything else, including even subordinate clauses here. So here I have a main clause, I'm going home because I'm tired. If I want to take the subordinate clause, put it at the beginning of the sentence, same thing, the uh, subject has to move behind the finite verb. So of course there is the potential here for people to, we found very, very few errors with this in our data, but we thought, well, what about the people in Canada um, who are exposed to only sentences um, of the SVO type? Maybe they will just come and prefer to put the subject there and leave everything else further in, uh, in the sentence behind the verb. So we looked at the distribution. First of all, the um, native, the monolingual natives. It's quite interesting to see that um, both German and Dutch use about half of subject, verb, whatever sentences, with a slightly higher preference for those in the German native speakers, the German controls and the Dutch controls. Um, they both have more or less the same proportion, Dutch slightly higher proportion of um, elements in the first position that are neither the subject nor the object, but a prepositional phrase is something like that. Um, objects, really very, very few of them preposed. Again, slightly more of them in Dutch than in German and slightly fewer subordinate clauses preposed in Dutch than in German. These are the controls. Um, the uh, German speakers in Canada have shifted ever so slightly towards indeed preferring the subject. Um, the German speakers in the Netherlands have sort of moved more towards the distribution favored by Dutch and the G Dutch speakers in Canada haven't shifted at all. Non-nominals, um, Here's the only significant difference that we found at all, which is the Germans have not only moved more to, the Germans in the Netherlands have not only moved towards the Dutch setting, but actually overshot that target. 
and everybody else has stayed exactly the same. And really the same is true for the other patterns. So there is maybe a, a slight trend for the distribution to approach that of the second language, but basically the distribution remains more or less stable. There's no, there are no sweeping changes here. Um, the verbal bracket, um, Dutch and German both tend, both frame certain elements of the sentence between the finite and the non-finite part, particularly in German. You have the finite bit of the, so if you have an auxiliary participle construction, you have the finite bit, the auxiliary, and you have two pages of text, and then you get the participle. Um, which is, again, one of those things that foreigners really never really get and don't understand why, and I don't understand why we need that. Um, there is a slight difference between Dutch and German in how much material we tend to stick between the two. So if you have the sentence, she has stolen a bread from, the baker's, from a baker's van, German would have a preference for putting both the object and the prepositional clause between the two bits. Um, in Dutch, that is actually questionable. It's not wrong, but it would be dispreferred. Um, on the other hand, Dutch would prefer to have the object between the two bits of the verb and the prepositional phrase at the end. And that, again, in German is not outright wrong and bad, but it is dispreferred. Um, and then in both languages, it is unambiguously ungrammatical to have both outside. So you can't do that in either of the languages. And um, it unsurprisingly, based on that, in the Dutch native data that we had, the inner field was shorter than in the German native data and the extraposed constituents were longer. And what we saw was that um, the Germans in Canada and the Germans in the Netherlands kind of move away from putting stuff into the inner field, uh, as do the Dutch speakers in Canada. Um, and for all of them, the extra post field becomes longer. So what we find here is generally a preference for a slight simplification and not to pull apart these constituents independently of what the second language does. So, um, Interim conclusion here is that attrition leads to an increase in variability and optionality. Again, that is exactly what both Barbara and Antonella said yesterday at all linguistic levels. Similarity between the languages facilitates that. So the closer, the more typologically similar the languages are, the more likely you are to find attrition effects. There are quite consistently differences at group level that are significant but small. There's always, I have never seen any empirical study of attrition that hasn't found a substantial proportion of arthritis scoring within the control group range. And uh, there's always, there are always, again, I have never found anything to contradict that, always very limited levels of inaccuracy, even among the most strongly arthritic participants. I haven't seen a single case where error rates have exceeded 5% which incidentally for second language learning is the level where we assume native-like acquisition to have taken place. So there is no evidence for fundamental or underlying restructuring of languages. Um, but then the question that I want to ask today is how, what drives this change? So beyond the purely linguistic, I'm gonna look at sort of the environment and things like that. And we know that different populations vary very much in how affiliated they are to their languages. Michael Klein has found that in some um, populations, for example, Greeks and Italians, the language tends to be passed on down through subsequent generations, whereas other populations make the shift very rapidly. And the Dutch are often given as an example of that. Whereas within populations, um, some individuals remain perfectly native-like after decades and others are not. So that's the bit that I want to zoom in now. Why do you think that is? And I would like everybody to um, just have a quick think, go to the chat and type in. So if you have one person who is really strongly attracted, has a strong foreign accent, 
um, code switches all the time, makes lots of errors and things like that. And another person um, with the same language combination, who's still very, very good, what do you think, what things could be different in their lifestyle, in their environment? Just type the first thing that you can think of into the chat, please. Of these factors, exposure, motivation. Emotional attachment, exposure, daily use, language use, aptitude, language status, family language policy, overall use of L2, importance of L1, exposure, use, exposure, social engagement, culturation, age of acquisition, exposure, status of language, exposure, empathy, use and exposure, and so on. Thank you very much. That's absolutely brilliant. And um, Yes, we have, uh, those are the things, all of those are the things that have often been, use and exposure is the thing that is most often uh, mentioned here. Um, I've just uh, listed these factors here and I think most of them did come up somewhere. Age of migration, length of residence, educational level, aptitude, uh, amount of contact, attitudes, attitudes to both the L1 and L2 language, country and culture, but also attitudes towards maintenance and attitudes towards language learning in general. So what we have here is a very complex and multifaceted setting. Um, research so far has really failed largely to demonstrate the individual impact of these factors. And there are good reasons for that. So if you think of something like length of residence or frequency of use, what we would expect to find is a pattern that looks maybe a little bit like this. So I've plotted here on the y-axis, in this case just for an accent as, an, as one example, just one example of how I could measure the um, proficiency that somebody retains in their language. And then on the x-axis here, I've plotted len length of residence here, I've plotted frequency of L1 use. Now this is, as I said, what we would expect to find. Um, we would expect to find a really strong correlation here. These data are made up. Um, they are absolutely 100% fake. And I've only made those up to illustrate the thing that ideally we would like to see in practice if you take the foreign accent ratings for the people that I looked at before and plot them against the length of residence and the frequency of use, this is what you find, which is absolutely nothing. And um, there is a very slight tendency to increase here with length of residence. But here, this is the person in the entire sample that has the longest length of residence and is also one of the people with the best foreign accent rating overall. Whereas up here, we have people with a bad foreign accent rating at the same level of Expo length of exposure. Here we have people who got really, really bad very fast, are among the people with the shortest length of residence. And again, we see people here, people really good who hardly ever use their first language and really bad who use their first language all the time. So that is what we actually tend to find when we look at it empirically. And that is why we are unable to identify the drivers of attrition. And I think the reason why research has, uh, this data was for German. Um, thank, you for, thank you for asking, sorry, I didn't clarify that. This was, these were the German speakers in the sample that you saw before. Um, I think there are two reasons why we haven't been able to really make a coherent picture and come to a full understanding. Um, they are partly statistical because, as you have seen, the impact of the predictors is not linear. We can try and draw a regression line through a scatter plot like that, but it doesn't make sense because the data are really so all over the place. The impact of the predictors is not consistent between participants. Predictors interact with each other and they are much more multifaceted than any regression and analysis can handle we, because we need to create averages. We need to, in order to do a regression, we need to conflate many measures together. So the traditional statistical methods, ANOVAs, regression, linear regression, and so on, that we tend to use in, in second language acquisition and in these kinds of studies, just 
do not allow us to capture the variability that there is. And then there is the second reason, which is conceptual, um, and has is to do with the fact that attrition doesn't affect only one language. Attrition is the outcome of an overall process of development that takes place in both languages. So if you look only at second language acquisition, second language development, or if you look only at attrition, you are missing half the picture. So we have to know, in order to be able to understand what's going on, we have to know not only what is happening to their first language, to their native language, we also have to know what is happening to their second language. And so uh, for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a study of bilingual development that I did together with Gülls and Yilmaz. It was published two years ago. We looked at the same German speakers as above, um, the Germans in Canada and the Germans in the Netherlands. And we also looked at Turkish and Moroccan Arabic speakers um, in the Netherlands. So we have Two populations here, which are really, really diverse in that in one case, we're looking at relatively closely typologically related languages. And in the other, we are looking at typologically very distant languages. Again, everybody uh, late bilingual with at least 10 years and again, very long average periods of residence. They were quite comparable between the studies. Now, what we did for the German speakers, we focused on control data on a focused task. We took a gap filling task, a C-test, so a very formal assessment of higher order language skills. And we made them give detailed self-assessments of their language skills across all four uh, skills, speaking, reading, listening, and writing. Um, so we asked them questions such as, um, can you understand uh, spoken language even when it's very fast and dialects are used? So very, very high level uh, questions about their understanding and about the way that their ability to produce complex spoken language, complex written language and these kinds of things. Um, for the Turkish and Moroccan Arabic groups, we looked at a completely different aspect of their proficiency. We looked at lexical diversity and fluency. So we measured how fast they were able to name items in a picture naming task. We looked at the lexical diversity in free speech and we looked at the fluency in free speech. And crucially for all of these things, we had measures in both the L1 and the L2. And if we plotted the two uh, against each other, so here, this is the average on these measures for the German speakers in the L1, and here's the average in the L2, and the same thing for the Turks and the Moroccans. You can see a very slight tendency for people who perform better in one language to also perform better in the other. You can kind of see the cloud sort of goes from the lower left to the upper higher quad quad quadrant square whatever um, of this of the of these pictures but it's absolutely not conclusive we have people um, here for example somebody who performs very poorly in the l2 and very well in the l1 and so we again the data are spread out across the entire range so then what i did is some is something that i always tell everybody my students and my colleagues and everybody who comes to me for statistical advice never to do which is i dichotomize things so i identified for both these data sets um, the level in German and the level in uh, the level in the L1 and the level in the L2 below which and above which an equal number of number of participants had scored. So in other words, I did a median split. So everybody who is to the left of this vertical line here, can you actually see when I uh, when I move my mouse, Beatrice, if you can see my mouse, yes. Uh, thank you. So everybody who's to the left of this vertical line. Um, perform was in the lower half of the German uh, of the L2 proficiency among the German speakers. Everybody above here was in the sort of higher L2 proficiency. And here there are half of the speakers are above this horizontal line 
in German, that means they are in the high performing group and people are in the low performing group. So that means that I have four diverse groups. The first of them is the good maintainers and good learners, the people who performed high in both the L1 and the L2. I have the good maintainers and poor learners who were good in German but poorly in the, poor in the L2. I have the good learners, bad maintainers, and I have the people who, are, who perform under the median in both of their languages. So these are four groups. And the, uh, the reason I did this is because I wanted to use a technique that is known as discriminant function analysis. Discriminant function analysis needs a categorical outcome. So that is the group membership into my four groups, good maintainer, good learner, poor maintainer, poor learner, and so on. Um, I have to associate every participant with one of these four groups and then I can throw everything that I know about them into this analysis. I can throw in the LOR, education, how much they use uh, their L1 in a lot of different settings and so on and so forth. I can put all of that in and the analysis will identify for me how these things go together. So it will find bundles of factors that can predict what group every individual will belong to and find the combination of factors that is most successful at making this prediction. So the advantage is that this analysis can handle nonlinear interactions through the fact that I've dichotomized people and put them into these different squares. It can handle many, many predictors far more than any regression analysis could ever do. Disadvantage is we lose variability because if I look up here, for example, at my German good maintainers, good learners, we zoom in on that a little bit, you can see that there are people here who are really close to the cutoff, really close to the borderline. Here is somebody who, yes, they're doing well um, in German, but they're really close to being, to being classified into the um, good learner but poor maintainer class. Here's somebody who's doing exceedingly well in German but has only just managed to make it into the good maintainer, good learner, would have almost fallen into good maintainer, bad learner. And then up here is somebody who really excels in both skills. The analysis does not see any difference between these three people. For the analysis, they're all the same. They're all good learners, good maintainers. Let me just check with you whether um, that is clear to everybody because it is a sort of a bit of a conceptual leap. So if you've understood everything really clearly, give me a 10. A um, couple of people want the main point summarizing again. I'll do that as I go through the next analysis. Yeah, on the whole, so nobody is under, nobody is lower here than a five so far. So thank you. I'll, um, I'll try and go through it as I explain the analysis and hope that then everybody will be with me. Thank you very much. Um, so I took my two populations, Turkish Moroccan speakers in the Netherlands on the one hand, German speakers in Canada and, uh, and the Netherlands on the other, and I carved them up into these four groups, good maintainers, good learners, good maintainers, poor learners, good learners, poor maintainers, poor learners, poor maintainers. And then what did I know about these people? I had a total of 21 variables that I knew about them. The first was how old they were when they were tested. Then I had their length of residence and their educational level. Then I had asked them a lot of questions, all Likert scale type questions. How often did they speak the first language and the second language with friends and family? There was a total of six questions about that with people back home at work, how often they were passively exposed, television, internet, media, books, and so on what their attitudes were, what language they preferred, what culture they preferred, how important it was to them that their children learned the language, and I also asked them to self-assess their proficiency in both languages. 
So 21 variables, you can see already um, with the group sizes that I'm looking at here, it would never have been possible to put all of these variables into a regression analysis. And also because they interact and contradict each other and stuff, um, I wouldn't have been able to get a coherent picture with all of that. I would have to, had to conflate everything into uh, larger measures. Um, so the, what the discriminant function analysis does is it looks at the group membership of every individual and it looks at what they know, uh, what it knows about the individual based on these 21 variables. And it says, how can I best explain, looking at everything I know about this person, why that person is a good maintainer, good learner, or why that person is a poor learner, learner, poor maintainer. And it takes these variables and combines them together into bundles, into packages, saying, okay, taken together, these are the packages that allow me to, uh, to explain why um, these, people, these, these people are in group uh, four versus group one and so on. And so the analysis has identified three such packages. Now remember, there are different populations, different languages, completely different skills that we looked at. Um, and for both groups, the analysis identified three predictor bundles, variable bundles. For the Germans, function one, so that's the first little package, um, explained about 54% of the variance. For the Turkish, it's about 58, so remarkably similar here. And the interesting thing was that more or less the same features, more or less the same variables went into those packages. So there was the use of the L1 with family and friends went into the same package for both groups. Length of residence, and then for the Turks, preferred language and culture went into that. And um, for German, there were more uh, factors associated with L1 and L2 use, where L1 use loaded positively, L2 use loaded negatively. So this really was a function that captured frequency of use, more or less. The second function captured mainly level of education, um, professional language use, which to some extent is a function of level of education. Um, and then the third function had to do with attitudes and motivation. So this was basically, and I think it's already really interesting and significant that this analysis, which looked at different languages and completely different skills, completely different ways of using the language, identified these very similar functions um, together. So what does this mean for the German speakers? So this is just, uh, just an illustration. Here are all of my German speakers. Um, the little symbols here represent what group they're in. So everybody who has this red triangle was identified as a good maintainer and a good learner. On the, what is expressed here in the scatter plot is the L1 use. So everybody who is to the right hand side of this chart is a person who uses the L1 a lot. And everyone who is on the left hand side of this chart is a person who doesn't use the L1 um, a lot. So this is where the people, so the, situ the place where you are in the graph now has nothing whatsoever to do anymore with how good you are at the language. It um, situates you here on the uh, on the horizontal scale it situates you with respect to language use whereas on the vertical scale it situates you with respect to level of education socioeconomic status literacy and so on um, people at the lower end here are the people with less education less literacy and so on right. now the interesting thing is if we look at um, what group these individuals belong to. Um, I'm going to take out of this chart here everybody who is a good maintainer, ir irrespective of whether they perform high in the L L2 or low in the L2. I'm only going to leave the people in the chart who are doing badly with respect to the L1 in the, in the tasks that we gave them. And what you can see is they all pattern towards the left end of the scale. So they all pattern towards the low levels of L1 use. 
they all use their L1 re relatively infrequently. If I look at the good maintainers only, at first glance, you can't see any pattern here. But if I take out the people who are good maintainers and good learners, you can see that all good maintainers and poor learners are the people who score highly on input. So there is this tendency here for people with low exposure to perform poorly in the L1 and the people with high exposure to perform well in the L1, but that tendency does not apply at all to the people who perform well in the L1 and the L2. The people who perform well in the L1 and the L2 are probably the people who have high levels of aptitude because they're the people who manage to become really, really good in the second language. And for those people, apparently, it does not seem to matter whether or not they get the exposure. So what this analysis has shown me here is that it is necessary to have a high level of L1 input in order to maintain your first language at a high level, unless you have a high level of aptitude, then you don't need the input. And I think this is really interesting. I think this is something that no other way of looking at the data and no other way of analyzing the data would have revealed. And I'm not going to talk you through the Turkish Moroccan data in the same way, but basically we found exactly the same thing here. And then for the second function, if we look at the good learners only, we see that there is a tendency for the good learners to score high on that function and a tendency for the poor learners to score low on that function, which basically allows us to conclude that a higher level of education, socioeconomic status, high level of literacy, all these kinds of things facilitate how people perform in the L2. So the, um, to sum up what we found about the cumulative use of the L1 is that for the controlled skills task that we did for the German speakers, we found that all poor maintainers score low on the variables associated with how frequently they are exposed to the second language, that all good maintainers and poor learners score high on that function, but that good maintainers and good learners are distributed much more wild, wild, widely. And we found exactly the same thing for the Turkish and Moroccan speakers. So that suggests to us that a limited amount of L1 use, a high amount of L2 use, and a long period of residence together lead to language attrition unless they are compensated for by a high level of language learning aptitude. And we found this exact same pattern in both of these studies. For education, we found that good learners tended to score high on the second language and poor learners, uh, poor learners tended to sc score high on education, poor learners tended to score low. Again, we found exactly the same thing across both studies, suggesting that high level of education, high SES, high literacy facilitate higher levels of proficiency. So um, let me check again whether hopefully this is now um, clearer. I'm also nearing, don't, do not despair, I am nearing the end of my presentation. <laughs> so, um, good, yes, everybody so far seems to be, I'll give you five more seconds to uh, vote, five, four, three, two, one. Not despairing, great presentation, somebody said. Thank you very much. That's the vote of confidence that a person likes to hear. And this also is the kind of vote of confidence that I like to see. So basically, what this discriminant analysis has shown, I think, is that the, so the feature bundles that we put together were used by the analysis to predict the group membership for each particular person. And then what we do in discriminant analysis is we take out the knowledge, what um, group every, so 
the program went into there knowing this person is in that group, this person is in that group, this person is in that group. It put together its little fe feature packages, variable packages, um, to see how well they um, go together with the group membership. And then we take away the knowledge of the, so then we just make the computer forget that that person was here, that person was here, and say, just use what you know based on these 21 variables, just use what you know to predict where they would fall. And that was able, that sort of kind of verifying of the predictions that were made was able to account for about three quarters of the cases in both studies. Um, and I'll just show you here for the German speakers. So this is not where people, where, where we classified people initially, but where they came out. And you can see here that actually most of the cases here, as I said, two th uh, three quarters of the cases were classified directly. To make this a bit clearer, I'm going to take out of this chart everybody who was classified, uh, who was classified correctly, only leaving the people who were um, classified wrong. And you can see that relatively close to this line here, you have quite a few green symbols that should be on the other side, but they're all really, really close. So they're really the marginal cases. Up here, again, you have some red uh, triangles. Again, they should be on the other side. So for the German study, we find that there's a strong tendency for the misclassified cases to be the marginal ones. In the uh, Turkish and Moroccan Arabic speakers, there are a few more extreme cases in particular. Have a look at this um, person up here and this person down here. The interesting thing about the person up here, she was supposed to be, based on her background and based on everything we know about her, she was supposed to be a poor learner and poor main maintainer. Instead, she really excelled both in her Turkish and in her Dutch. She was a woman who was brought up in Turkey across to, uh, according to very traditional values. She never had many educational opportunities. She was married very young. She came to the Netherlands with her husband and she discovered there um, how to sort of um, express herself through becoming, she was very, very motivated to become a really good Dutch speaker. And she started really for the first time to experience a sort of independent life. So um, this is an example, I think, where um, personal experience and motivation to become a highly proficient speaker in the second language and all these kinds of things can just override these statistical predictions and where people, and I think these are the cases that we need to look at in order to really understand why there's this general pattern, but also why some people go against this pattern. So um, just to sum up, what we did, and I'm sorry to hammer this point home, but if you're familiar with uh, the, if, if you're familiar with the literature on attrition, then I think it is, it, I was so surprised to see these patterns because we tend to find even when we do similar tasks and look at similar populations, we tend to find contradicting results. So the fact that we investigated here, both populations that were very different in terms of the languages that they spoke, but also really, really different skills and really, really different um, ways of interacting and engaging with the language. Um, Despite that, the outcome of the analyses was really consistent across these two studies, suggesting that L1 contact facilitates L1 maintenance. You may go, duh, but if you know the literature on attrition, you'll see that this is something that, is, that almost never comes out of the data, that high levels of aptitude can compensate for low levels of input and that high levels of education facilitate L2 performance. Beyond these specific findings, I think what I'm really taking forward from this study is bilingual development is two-dimensional. And if you look at only the first language or only the second language, you will miss really important and really, really obvious points. You will limit your own potential for insight. This awareness we need to use more to inform studies of attrition as well as of second language acquisition. Linear regression models 
are not the way to go here because the patterns of interaction and development that we see and the interaction of predictors and outcome variables is not linear. We need to engage with really new ways of, and we need to be open to understanding and applying really new ways of analyzing data. That's it for me. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions already in the chat. Um, if you'd like to uh, ask questions, you should feel free to unmute yourself and just shout at me, but you can also type them in the chat. So the first question here is, can similar studies also be done for Punjabi migrants to Canada? And will phonetically or semantically similar L1 and L2 give different results? What factors could be important? You can, of course, do exactly these kinds of analyses with every language combination that you want or with every setting that you want. There is no reason why you shouldn't. Um, typology is the more similar, that was really the point from the example of Johannes Hestes, the more similar the languages are, the more attrition will be facilitated. But you also find really interesting patterns, of course, in speakers of two or more typologically very diverse languages. The only limits is uh, to what you can do. This is why we didn't do these formal tasks with the second study is you can only use tasks that look at written language in languages that have a written system. Moroccan Arabic is not a written language. Um, all Moroccan Arabic speakers use standard Arabic um, when they read and write. That was why in the, those cases we couldn't do that. So that's the only limit that you've got. Everything else is perfect. There was a question here from Philippe Kapp. Sorry, um, not even going to try and pronounce that because I would mangle it. Um, language attrition is quite a new field in Brazil. We have a lot to learn. Um, thank you so much. I'm glad the attrition, language attrition website was useful to you. Um, and just scanning the question. Uh, yes, controlling the quality of recordings is a really big problem. And of course, right now, we cannot even go to the lab and record people, so that's a problem. Uh, effects of test and task type on attrition data. Um, so what we find in attrition is that if you use control tasks such as, I've, I've mentioned some examples here, picture naming, grammaticality judgments, because attrition is such a subtle phenomenon, um, your tasks have to be quite subtle. If you just give people um, uh, a, a straightforward pen and, pay, pen and pencil grammaticality judgment task, chances are that you will miss the more subtle aspects of this. So um, be very creative when you, uh, when you devise your experiments and your stimuli. Look um, very closely at other experiments that have come before. And I would always recommend that in addition to doing experiments, you do something where you just make your participants talk. The Charlie Chaplin experiment is a great way of doing that. You can also just interview them about themselves. Get some free speech. You will find things from the free speech that you will not find in um, experimental data. If you want some references or tips uh, for literature, do drop me an email. I'm very happy to help you out and send you some more. Um, we did not test aptitude, um, Barbara, that, that was you. We did not test aptitude. I am sort of cheating a little bit here. Thank you for finding me out on that. I'm cheating a little bit here. I uh, assumed that the people who scored very highly in the L2 would be the people because they were all late learners and there have been all of these findings saying that if you're a late learner you can only become really really good if you have high levels of aptitude. I use that as a correlate but absolutely that is something that really needs to be done. Um, I'm, I'm planning whenever I'm able to do my next study I am planning to do some sort of aptitude uh, measure. Um, um, discriminant function analysis minimum sample size and would I recommend any books and papers I have 
I, I'm sorry to say it's a while since we did this, so I don't have all of these facts at my fingertips. I did um, have some really good literature and references about this. Again, feel free to drop me an email and I'm very happy to send this. The paper was published in 2018 in Frontiers. Um, so you should be able, if you just search for Yilmaz and Schmidt, you should be able to find it. We explain more, of course, about the discriminant function analysis. Um, how much were the measures based on production or perception of L1 and L2? Um, all of the tasks that we did were production, um, except that in the can-do scales, we also asked about understanding and comprehension of complex spoken and written language. Um, there is, we didn't directly test perception of the L1. And I think the general feeling is that um, if there are any changes at all to perception in L1 attrition, they will be very, very subtle. But as far as I'm aware, there is no research about that. Um, I hope that answers your question, Yuri. Uh, Otherwise, please feel free to type uh, type a clarification question at the bottom. Um, could I repeat about the first study? People migrated and only spoke L2. So they migrated, they lived in a second language environment and how much they spoke the, the first and the second language, that was actually what was covered by this uh, first function that we have here. So what you've actually got um, in the, if you look at the cumulative use here, you have people, um, Sorry, here, you have people who speak the L1 all the time, speak the L2 relatively little and haven't lived. So those features all go together on this function. So everybody in this chart here, who is towards the right hand side, still has quite high levels of L1 use. And everybody down here who is at the left hand side has relatively low levels of L1 use and relatively high levels of L1 use. And I think that is something that is necessary. We, if we only, if we restrict the data collection as people have sometimes attempted to do, if we restrict it to people with only low levels of exposure, we wouldn't be able to see these patterns because there would be no variance and no variability on this function. Valeria, again, if, if that hasn't answered your question, do please uh, type it again into the chat. Uh, regarding the problem of high variance, would it be conceivable to use just the upper and lower 25% individual? Um, uh, it would probably require a higher sample size. Um, um, so you would only include only the extreme cases. It, it would be an interesting experiment. It would be an interesting thing to, to try and see. Um, of course, what we do see here is that these extreme cases are, there are relatively few such extreme cases. So if you drew, drew the line, if you drew the line here, most of the people actually are within this sort of middle square. So, I'm not sure. I mean, we need to find other ways. This is not an ideal way of doing this at all, but it was the best way I could come up with. Um, Peter. Oh, hi, Peter. Nice. I didn't realize you were here. Hello. Um, how would I define aptitude as a crucial factor? As, as I said in response to Barbara's question, great minds think alike, obviously. Um, in this case, we had a very clumsy measure of aptitude, which was just how good are these people in the L2. I would love to apply, so there are these aptitude measures that I'm sure you're familiar with, Paul Mira's Lama test and so on, that have been validated quite rigorously in terms of how good people are at language learning. So um, we need to do that. Um, here, it's just a really clumsy simplification of associating L2 attainment with aptitude. Um, if the community is bilingual by default, how do we measure L1 and L2 attrition? Um, well, for I didn't talk about that here because I looked at the relationship of L1 and L and L2, which of course we can't do 
by definition in the monolinguals. We also have we also have done studies where we compared how these people performed in their L1 with what uh, control people, unattrited control speakers did. So for all of the things, for all of the um, measures that I've presented here today, we had previously established that the writing populations differed statistically from control populations. Um, uh, thank you so much for all the lovely things that you said. I'm just scrolling through to find uh, the, where there are questions. It's unlikely that there are, that attrition leads to restructuring. Do I think that there are structures that are more likely to be affected. So I think what has come out of uh, studies based on the inter interface uh, hypothesis, the things that Antonella talked about yesterday, um, is that what, what is at stake here is not the actual knowledge, but the way in which the knowledge is applied, that people get, in Antonella's examples yesterday, keep, people get a little bit more wobbly about when, for example, to use um, when, for example, to use an all pronoun or an overt pronoun, and this has nothing to do with the grammatic, the grammatical knowledge of how to make a sentence containing an all pronoun or an overt pronoun, is perfectly intact. What has suffered or eroded or become wobbly or whatever you want to call it is the knowledge when to use one over the other, and. So that already uh, that already kind of answers the question. The structures are fine. It's those cases probably also where that where those the way in which these things are used. Think back to the examples that I gave of German and Dutch sentence structure, where it's a little bit up in the air which of them were native speakers might have a sort of statistical prob probabilistic preference but not a clear-cut preference for one or the other those are probably the things that are affected more quickly um, i conclude that high education facilitated high l2 performance could it also be that the l2 proficiency affects the education level that participants reach um, we had very few people who continued their education after they had left their country of origin. Of course, in many cases, that may feed in. If you want to study um, at an English-speaking university, you already need a higher level of, uh, of, of English. And if you come to an English-speaking country without that, then you cannot continue your education. Of course, that um, makes sense. Um, do I have data or speculations about short-term effects, surprise, excitement, etc., on performance? Um, I'm sure they all, they all really matter. I mean, that is one of the big problems about attrition and L2 uh, research, we tend to only have snapshots. And what I really know about myself is when I get tired, when I get upset, um, my ability to use any of my languages suffers. I, I have more of an accent, I have more word finding difficulties, I make more mistakes. So I'm sure all these kinds of things play a huge big role. Um, to what extent they are specific to attrition or just affect how well we are able to use any of our languages, I'm not sure. Um, why did we use uh, determinant, uh, discriminant function analysis, not principal component analysis? Well, principal component analysis, um, principal component analysis would have looked only, we've done that before for, for other studies, looks only at the predictors, looks only at the 21 um, things that we know about our, that we knew about our arthritis and packages them together based on how well they, what internal consistency is there is within that data, but does not take into account, so principal component uh, uh, analysis is not based on a kind of outside overriding dichotomous categorical, not dichotomous, categorical predictor such as we did here for um, proficiency. So principal component analysis, factor analysis tries to, stru to structure, to, to uh, identify patterns on a set of predictors based on their structure, not based on a sort of outside um, characteristic. 
Um, I think more questions are coming in. I think what we'll do, um, because people were pointing out, and I really, really wanted to, to do that also, um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll go, and um, everybody should feel absolutely free to go to the break. I'll stay here until half past uh, reading, reading your questions and answering them, but everybody should feel really free to go off and have a cup of coffee or the opposite or whatever. Thank you, Monica. I, I wouldn't interrupt you, you know, absolutely. Yeah. So our idea, I thought our idea about 15 minute break, given the speakers that we have was a bit of optimistic, but go ahead. Yeah. So it didn't work. Um, then uh, there was, I, um, did I measure code switching? No. What is my view, view on code switching relating attrition? I think code switching is a strategy that bilinguals use that is probably usually unrelated to attrition. People code switch for all sorts of reasons, um, for, for stylistic reasons, for uh, reasons of comprehensibility, because they feel that an L2 item captures the meaning um, that they want to express better than, uh, than L1. If you, sorry, if I can just shamelessly plug myself, if you uh, want to have a look at this textbook, 2011 textbook, um, I have, uh, the, that com contains a fairly detailed section about code switching, if you want to know the full detail of my views about it. Question seems to have, seem to have dried up. Everybody has probably gone to their, uh, to their well-deserved coffee break. Uh, so thank you all very, very much for your attention, for the many interesting insights, for participating in the polls. It's been a huge, big pleasure. And of course, I massively look forward to listening to all the other talks. And thanks again, Andre and Beatrice and Mikhail for the organization. Uh, thank you once again. It was a fascinating talk. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's lots, a lot more questions that people would like to ask. Um, first, let me congratulate all of us and the morning in particular and fantastic uh, opening talk of this session. Please have a wee break. Um, I understand behind the curtains we agreed to start the next talk a bit later. Um, five past, maybe even... 10 past, I don't know, five past.